Order. And it's time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And we will start with listed questions. And I call Mr. Robin Swan. Mr. Swan. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker with permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Racial equality and good race relations remain key goals for this department. Recent race hate attacks are indeed a brutal reminder that we need to strive to achieve these goals and not to take them for granted. Attacks, whilst relatively few in number, they cause fear, they cause alarm, they cause despondency uh, among our minority communities, and, and they shame all of us. Yet they reinforce our determination to create a society that allows people of all backgrounds to live here in peace and to be treated with respect and to be treated with dignity. We are working on a strategy that will genuinely tackle the barriers that stand in the way of people feeling that they belong here. We're, we received a large number of responses to last year's 16-week public consultation. We had 97 written responses from groups and individuals. We had 303 requests for consideration of specific strategies for Roma and for traveller people. We had 49 online questionnaires completed, and we had feedback from six public meetings and other meetings with academics, uh, trade unions, and other key stakeholders. The analysis of all of that is now being finalised. Officials have met with a large number of representatives of the sector to hear further reflection and input and to clarify what are the key issues. This engagement, Mr. Speaker, along with the analysis of the consultation responses, will inform the final strategy. We want to, in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, produce a strategy that embodies both the aspirational and also the everyday needs of the families and individuals who have come to live here and who have contributed so much to our community. Thank you. And I call Mr. Robin Swan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response, and I agree with him when he says we all should be ashamed of these attacks while they, while they happen in our community. Does he agree that the absence of such a strategy is a hindrance in the efforts to combat this type of intolerance? And could he update the House as to when he thinks the strategy will be published? Well, there is a number of pieces of work uh, underway with the sector. I am not sure uh, that the people are perpetrating these attacks uh, necessarily are looking towards a strategy for the reason why they are, are behaving in such an abhorrent way. Uh, what we have sought to do is meet with the groups concerned. Um, we have listened carefully uh, to what their needs and aspirations are. There is tremendous local work going on right across Northern Ireland and specifically in our communities to make this a welcoming place. And it's vital now that all of those voices are brought together to deliver a strategy that delivers most for those for whom it is intended. And we will be not found wanting in that production. Thank you. And I call Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and can I thank the Minister for his answer? You will be aware that South Belfast has some uh, good examples of uh, community engagement on uh, race issues. But can I ask the Minister uh, what work is being done to actually improve and to increase community engagement uh, throughout uh, various communities with, in relation to race issues? Well, the member uh, is correct. There is some tremendous work being done right across Belfast and specifically in the South Belfast area. I look specifically towards the Belfast Mila as a key example where not only the Indian community, but the Indian community has led the way in bringing so many other cultures uh, that represent so much, who have contributed so much, who have put so much into the economy, who have made a net gain contribution from the minority ethnic sector into our economy, into our society. And it's made us that diverse and rich society that we are. When I first went in uh, 2000, I think it was, and 11 to the Belfast Mela in August, I was overwhelmed at the numbers. And yet, year on year on year, those numbers are getting bigger, and the community involvement from the whole community right across Belfast 
is now so strong that you have to queue for a huge amount of time to get in there because that's the work that the community sector is doing in terms of integration, in terms of celebrating diversity, and in terms of enjoying the society that we are today in Northern Ireland, enriched by the diversity that is brought together. And we hope our strategy, as has the Minority Ethnic Development Fund, which we kept at its uh, current level, despite all the crisis and pressure that was on us financial, is our commitment uh, to the minority ethnic sector and to the community sector to continue to build on those good race relations. Again, I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Where am I? I'll get the Karen Collian going great concession error down Fraga, and I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, I think we all agree that political leadership is needed at the highest level to tackle which is a growing problem of racism. Would the Minister agree that his party's failure to distance itself from racist uh, views and indeed previous comments by his party leader fuel intolerance, racism and disrespect toward all, all the cultures and races? Well, you know, it is very difficult uh, for those of us who have come through. We don't want to look back to the past. But when I look to the amount of people that were murdered by the Republican movement, maimed by the Republican movement, a movement that went across Europe shooting people, shooting children and everything else, I think the member, if he wants to look back, has significantly enough material in terms of the abuse of people that his own Republican movement was involved in without pointing the finger at anybody else. From the First Minister down and our party, we have completely condemned all racist and recent hate incidents. But I'm the First Minister of the Islamic community, the Indian community, where wherever we are, we have a consistent and a strong message. And I don't know where he's getting those messages from because they are not being given to me by the minority ethnic development community. What the First Minister has done uh, with ourselves is, and our officials, whenever we have seen a problem, we have worked with the minority ethnic development sector. We recently convened a special sitting of the Good Relations Board, in which we looked at what immediate action we all could take in OFM to FM to tackle race hate. That programme board has met on a number of occasions, and we will be meeting again on a number of occasions, because what we want to do is collaboratively work together to ensure in that minority of cases, and it is a minority of cases, where there are uh, race hate attacks to show that they don't represent us. They are not representative of any party in this House. And frankly, silly slurs like that do not help anybody. I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, the Ethnic Minority Fund for 2013 to 2015 entered on the 31st of March, and a new round of funding uh, is not known. Uh, to, it's not known to, to the organisations uh, when it will finish. Obviously, the two or three months gap in funding will negatively impact on the ability of ethnic minority organisations to help in finalising the, uh, the racial equality strategy. Can I ask the Minister, will he consider extending that funding to all the uh, organisations that have previously received funding for the last two years, until the outcome of the funding uh, is known. Can I say, first of all, uh, a sincere word of thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker, to Anna Lowe. She has been a tremendous assistance to us uh, in the office, uh, has met with us uh, regularly, um, has got a real credibility, and can help us understand the voice uh, of many within the minority ethnic development sector. And I want to personally record my thanks for all her assistance that uh, she has made. And a direct answer to the question, the invitation for the new applications opened on the 27th of March, and they will close today. As I said earlier, we are pleased to confirm that despite all of the financial pressures, the Minority Ethnic Development Fund is £1.1 million for the 2015-2016 financial year. And on top of that, we have put together a crisis fund of £100,000 uh, to help with those people most in need and in crisis. And we did that 
uh, as well as doing a number of drop-in workshops in Belfast, and Londonderry and Craigavon to help the groups in the application uh, process. And we, we hope to let the applicants know the outcome of their uh, application by the middle of next month. Now, there were a number of requests, as the member said, mostly from those who had been receipt of minority ethnic development funding, arguing just simply for the funding to be extended for a further period. Other organisations, the members were, supported the opening of a new call. People who weren't successful either previously or were involved in uh, doing work in that area but hadn't been funded. So some was new, some was not so new, and we wanted to see who could potentially serve their community well and broader society with the help of the funding uh, that is received. We felt it further to allow everyone to apply, to allow everyone to have the same uh, opportunity. And there were options put to us, such as the member suggested, such as just continuing uh, for, for a further period. And we took the decision uh, on balance that it was appropriate to open to all of the organisations. Thank you. And I call Mr. Patsy McLone. Everett Adaw, Hyun Kolya. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to begin by giving an overview of what we have already done to introduce affordable and flexible childcare. As you know, the first phase of the Executive's Child Care Strategy was launched back in September 2013. This included a number of key first actions to address the main child care needs identified through research and consultation. School-aged child care was the greatest area of need identified. The School-aged Child Care Grant Scheme, which we launched just over a year ago, was therefore developed to create new high-quality school-aged child care places and to sustain the places that we already have. To date, the grant scheme has allocated some £2 million to 50 successful school-age childcare projects. These projects will sustain or create approximately 1,500 low-cost quality childcare places. With regard to what we plan to do going forward, we expect to grant aid further school-age childcare projects before the summer and to launch a third call for applications to the grant scheme in the autumn. This will result in further low-cost childcare places being created or sustained. In parallel, work to develop the full childcare strategy has been taken forward on a co-design basis, with close engagement between officials, the childcare sector and childcare stakeholders. We aim to put the full strategy and its actions to public consultation in the coming weeks and to launch it in the autumn. Again, we expect that these additional actions will increase further the supply of low-cost childcare services, including flexible childcare services to meet the needs of parents who work on conventional hours. And I call Mr. McGlown for a supplementary. I call you. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I guess my translation is to come and my thanks to the minister. Um, could I ask the minister, please, if um, the office of First Deputy First Minister have raised? with the Minister for Education, the plan to cut, to cut funding and pre preschool funding, which has caused great concerns in both for parents and employees alike in the childcare sector, including the Early Years Organisation, and would his department be prepared to support um, in the June monitoring round a bid for extra funding for that sector? Well, first of all, can I say to the member that uh, I share his concerns uh, and indeed have uh, met uh, the stakeholders uh, involved. Uh, I know the uh, Education Minister is aware of the, the issue. We have uh, discussed it at an executive uh, meeting. Uh, in terms of uh, whether it can be assisted through monitoring rounds, the Finance Minister undoubtedly will take on board any bids that he receives. Uh, but I think we do need to be careful because I see this in the, the work, the art, if you like, of some government ministers that they hold back from their spending plans issues with, which they feel uh, the, uh, the executive would not want to see dropped in the hope that they can pull in additional resources to their budget for that purpose. So I think, first of all, the finance minister will want to be satisfied that the department cannot itself fund that priority and indeed to determine what other priorities the department has that uh, perhaps might be less important than the one that he has just mentioned. I'll call Ms. Brenda Hale. Thank you, 
Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for his answer so far. First Minister, you talked about how childcare places should be flexible and suit working parents. So, how many childcare places do you hope to create under the framework? Well, I, I indicated in the uh, initial uh, response that uh, we had uh, already uh, identified projects for 1,500. The overall schemes that, uh, when the, the various actions have been completed, uh, we hope to create in the region of uh, 8,000 places. Uh, that actually would turn out to be a uh, lower number per head of population than some other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, but uh, research also shows that there is a much higher level of uh, home support through grandparents and so forth in Northern Ireland than in other parts of the United Kingdom. I'll call Ms Sandra Overin. First Minister, what exactly is the role uh, for private sector childcare providers and how do they qualify for funding? Yes, well, the main objective, of course, of the Bright Start Key First Actions was to support affordable models of uh, childcare. Uh, private childcare providers uh, aim to make a, a profit. Uh, this is either reinvested in the building that they are using, it's given perhaps uh, for staff wage increases, or indeed to uh, supplement directors' remuneration. Uh, therefore, it wasn't viewed as suitable for the first key actions. However, we uh, have committed uh, that uh, we will look at ways of supporting small private providers in the uh, substantive childcare strategy, uh, providing it fulfils our aim of affordability for parents. I call on Ms. Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the First Minister why his department has failed to spend eight million of the twelve million allocated for childcare? Well, much of the application comes to us, so it's based on the applications we receive. Uh, and I think the Deputy First Minister and I were somewhat uh, disappointed that some other government uh, departments had not made either applications at all or sufficient applications to use up, up that uh, funding. Uh, however, the, the strategy is, is very clear. Uh, we are now basing it uh, on the, the principle that we want to provide uh, the best and most affordable low-cost childcare uh, to parents. There are other schemes that I think the, the member will be aware of which move away from the voucher scheme uh, to a tax-based uh, uh, support system. Uh, I think that, again, will considerably help uh, parents in Northern Ireland uh, for their uptake of schemes. Thank you. And I call Mr. Robin Newton. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, work is uh, progressing across the seven headline actions arising from the Together Building a United Community strategy. Following a second call for applications to the Shared Education Campuses programme, six proposals are currently being assessed, covering over 20 schools with decisions due in June of this year. Progress on the United Youth Programme has seen 50 organisations proceed to a further development stage, following which 10 pilot schemes will progress to delivery later in 2015. A total of five urban village locations have now been announced. There has been considerable stakeholder engagement in relation to the Lower Newton Large Road Urban Village Scheme, which the member may take a particular interest in. The first social housing development under the Shared Neighbourhoods Programme at Ravenhill Road has opened and a community cohesion plan is being developed. It is envisaged that nine out of ten of the remaining sites will be under construction during this financial year. Work to date has reduced the number of interface barriers from 59 to 52 and engagement is ongoing in 40 of the 52 remaining areas. The Summer Camps Pilot Programme opened for application on the 15th of April 2015 with a closing date of the 8th of May 2015. We are on target to deliver our commitment to deliver 100 summer camp pilots in 2015. A 12-week pilot project for the Cross-Community Youth Sports Programme ended on 31 March. The programme seeks to use sport in a central role to break down divisions in society and deliver a good relations programme to young people drawn from all sections of our community. An evaluation of the pilot will help inform the further rollout of the programme. I call Mr. Newton for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for that uh, very detailed uh, uh, outline. I wonder, would the First Minister uh, indicate to the House 
Uh, the amount of money that will indeed be spent on addressing this sectarianism issue, um, and particularly around the signature projects uh, within the T-Box strategy? Well, my colleague, the junior minister, spoke earlier of uh, the concerns and issues arising uh, from uh, racial tensions and hatreds, uh, and uh, I think it's right that uh, we speak out on all of those issues. It is equally right that uh, we look at the sectarianism uh, within our society, no matter where it is uh, displayed and no matter what its source may be. Uh, it is right, therefore, that uh, we were able to garner an additional £10 million of funds for, the, the, for TBOC, uh, and indeed a further £3 million on top of that uh, from the change fund. Uh, the benefit of that, because all that we do within this scope uh, is relating to improving relations uh, in every part of our society. Uh, and I personally take the, the view that the best way to deal with sectarianism, to start getting reconciliation in our community, is to uh, concentrate on people at the very youngest of ages within our society so that they might grow up, uh, not looking across a fence at somebody who is different from them, but somebody who can be a friend. I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister, two years on, what progress has been made on the TBUC commitment to roll out a buddy scheme in publicly run nursery and primary schools in Northern Ireland? Well, Mr. Speaker, the uh, buddy scheme is not a signature project under TBUC, but it is a, an action. Uh, however, the Department of uh, Education uh, is uh, in the lead on that uh, issue and have the responsibility for it. And I request more property could be put to the Education Minister. Thank you very very much, Mr Speaker. Um, good to hear about the summer camps, but would the First Minister confirm that the 100 summer camps that he's talking about are all new summer camps, and will summer camps be spread out throughout the whole summer holiday so they're not all jammed in at either the beginning or the end? Yep. Well, uh, I suppose the, the answer is that I couldn't possibly know the answer yet to his question because uh, it's out for application and we're waiting for the, the projects to, to be fully identified. Uh, if it is helpful to the member, as soon as we have identified those projects, I'll uh, make sure that he gets a, a copy and he can make his own judgment on how new they are or how widely spread they are. Thank you. And I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Karim Iger, can call you ever a Cahar question for? Uh, Mr. Speaker, with uh, your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have regularly stated our commitment to producing a sexual orientation strategy in the Assembly and in the text of the Good Relations Strategy, Together Building a United Community. To achieve this commitment, we asked officials to commence a public consultation process. The first phase of this process ended in June last year. Analysis of responses to that 12-week consultation period have been completed, and the results are being used to inform the content of a draft sexual orientation strategy. It is our intention to develop the strategy using the outcomes-based approach. This view was shared at the most recent meeting of the Sexual Orientation Project team on 15 April 2015. Work will continue over the coming weeks to develop outcomes and subsequent indicators with the project team. Once the draft strategy is finalised, it will be referred to the Committee of the Office of First and Deputy First Minister for consideration before seeking executive agreement. A further 12-week period of consultation will then take place, and I would anticipate that the sexual orientation strategy would be published after the, this final phase of consultation. I call Mr McMullen for supplementary. Can I thank the junior minister for his answer so far. Given recent events, will the junior minister uh, confirm that we need a, a sexual orientation strategy urgently? And will he distance himself from the views expressed by his party colleague Jim Wells? Well, I, I think already, if I can answer the question in the reverse way, that they were given in relation to the comments that were made relating to child abuse by Jim Wells. Jim Wells has made it clear that his comments were 
inaccurate and wrong. It is not a DUP view or policy, and we immediately publicly indicated that neither was it the DUP view now, nor will it be. Anyone saying it is, if they want to use it for some level of electioneering or whatever, they can take that there wherever they want to go. But it is not helpful uh, to people uh, who are looking towards a strategy. It's not helpful, particularly given the levels of uh, mental health that the sector has come and spoken to me about, and young people experiencing uh, not only mental health issues, but suicidal ideation and issues that particularly the trans community have spoken to me about uh, in relation to mental health and suicidal ideation. So the strategy will be there to try to do, give best practice to all of our people. And let me make it clear, we value the innate human dignity and worth of every one of our people, regardless of their background, the colour of their skin or their sexual orientation. Thank you. And I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Mr Speaker, thank you. Would the Minister agree with me, and, and indeed with very solid research from institutions such as Cambridge University, that when it comes to a child thriving at home, it's all about the degree of engagement and the quality of support, and not about whether it is a single parent, or a mother and father, or two parents of the same sex? There, there is a lot of research in terms of uh, child development. And what we know is children thrive best where there is stability, uh, where there is security, uh, where there is love. In fact, the greatest gift that we can give all of our children is the gift uh, of time to make sure that they grow up nurtured uh, in a secure environment where they can develop and fulfil their potential. And we should always look towards best practice in child development. Call Mr. Trevor Lund. Hey, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I, can I ask the junior minister uh, if he agrees with others within his party and perhaps without that, that homosexuality is a lifestyle choice? This issue uh, has, been has been raised uh, on a number uh, of occasions. And it's not for me to determine what a person's sexual orientation is or how they arrived at. It is for me as an MLA and as a minister to recognise the innate dignity and human worth of all our people. I will, regardless of a person's colour, their religious belief, their political opinion or their sexual orientation, always advocate and stand for the human rights of that individual. And in public policy, that is the stance that we will always take. Ms. Claire Sugden. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number five. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, unfortunately it is difficult to ascertain from the question what is really being asked. However, consultation takes place every year on a wide range of issues, some affecting all of the people of Northern Ireland, others relating to the needs of particular geographic areas, which is uh, what I take the member to mean by her reference to specific constituency matters. Uh, as the member infers, it is important that the method and scale of consultation is appropriate to the issue and a variety of methods have been increasingly used to maximise the participation of stakeholders in the consultation process. There is also an increasing emphasis on ongoing active engagement between government and citizens in the development of policy from the earliest stages and the move uh, away from relying exclusively on set-piece formal consultations. Consultation can therefore range from the traditional method of publishing a consultation document to, for example, roadshows, the facilitation of focus groups and, of course, direct engagement with local community interests. To stimulate interest and awareness, consultation documents and details uh, of uh, formal consultation events will also be published through local media as well as online at departmental and Northern Ireland Direct websites. I call Ms Sugden for a quick supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and I thank the First Minister for his answer. Um, I have a situation in Port Rush where we have a cross-departmental program um, about an initiative, and I've had a lot of representations from constituents who are concerned about the lack of consultation with them. So I just want to know what influence, if any, the First Minister and his deputy have in respect of influencing their departments to actually seek the views of the people who matter. 
Well, I, I don't know the particular case that the, the member is referring to, but uh, if she would like either to, to write to me or even bring a delegation to see the Deputy First Minister and I, uh, we're both always willing to, to meet people and to uh, hear their views on issues that affect our department. If it is uh, cross-departmental, it may well uh, involve some other minister. So if the member wants to speak to me afterwards, I I'm happy to see if we can assist her in making sure that people's views are heard. Uh, and the Deputy First Minister and I are always willing, where possible, to take those on board. Thank you. And that ends the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr Cahill Boylan. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, could I ask the First Minister, clearly there's been a litany of examples of homophobic remarks made by DUP representatives in the last number of years. Uh, given, Minister, that you have responsibility for equality, could you outline how you propose to address these issues? Well, Mr Speaker, I, I can recall on many occasions uh, how my predecessor used to tell uh, party colleagues uh, to remember that uh, we are a political party and not a church. It is the role of churches and of faith groups to direct the moral positions of people. That is not the role of political parties. However, it is necessary and at times it is unavoidable uh, for parties to take a position on public policy matters uh, as they relate to some of these uh, issues. However, one of the three core principles uh, of my party is that everyone is equal under the law and equally subject to the law. Uh, this party will defend the legal rights of everyone within our community and promote equality of opportunity. Uh, my party opposes any form of discrimination, whether it be uh, relating to sexual orientation or any other issue. In articulating public policy, we are mindful of the needs, and I trust every section of this House will be mindful of the needs for it to be conducted respectively uh, on all sides. The public policy issues that uh, we are currently dealing with relate to the issue of changing the definition of marriage to include same-sex uh, couples. As the law stands, people have a choice of entering into a civil partnership if they are a same-sex couple or engage in the ordinance of uh, marriage if they are a heterosexual couple. Uh, my party sees no justification for change. I call Mr Boylan for supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And could I thank the Minister for the answer? But I don't think the Minister has actually answered it. But could I put it this way? Could the Minister then outline how those views that are expressed will not lead to policies that will lead to discrimination? Because clearly I think those views that are expressed in recent times will lead to policies that discriminate against people. Mr Speaker, I do think that we need to be very careful on these uh, issues that we have some proportionality about how we react uh, to comments. Uh, this was uh, a comment made by a minister who for a considerable number of months has carried on his work during the day and been sitting beside his wife throughout the night as she has uh, undergone operations and as she has been fighting for her life. He recognised immediately he made the comments that they were inaccurate. He sought and got the attention of the chair to make uh, a uh, clarification at the meeting. He, after the meeting, gave a fulsome apology, an apology that we haven't had from others for the uh, crimes that they have committed in this society. Uh, and on the, the foot of that, uh, he has uh, recognised that the, the burden that he presently carries is so great that he does need to, to take uh, a, a break from frontline public life. Uh, that being the case, uh, I really do ask people that they should not take on the characteristics of a lynch mob about these matters. Uh, he has apologised. He has indicated that the facts were uh, inaccurate as he uh, related them. I immediately went out to indicate that they were not the views of the, the party now, nor ever would they be. Uh, and I think that's the clearest of all directions that I can give, that there will be no policy based upon information which the person who made the comment has already indicated he regarded to be inaccurate. 
Thank you. And I call Ms. Rosalie McCorley. Um, can I ask the Minister, uh, it's clear from Jonathan Bell's earlier remarks on the sexual orientation strategy um, that there is an attempt to drag this issue out. And will his party uh, commit to signing up to a sexual orientation strategy that tackles prejudice? Well, the, the, the member must have been listening to a different Jonathan Bell than I was uh, listening to, uh, nothing he said was uh, indicating that there was an intention to drag this uh, issue uh, out. The strategy uh, undergoing consultation being prepared within the, the office uh, will come forward uh, to the executive as a whole uh, in order to be uh, approved. Uh, and, uh, I imagine that, that will take uh, its own pace as it goes through those uh, issues. Uh, I can think of a, a number of issues which are being delayed at, a level, at an executive uh, level uh, that the, the member isn't so enthusiastic to have pushed through, which will have a very profound impact uh, on the future of this Assembly and of Northern Ireland. I call Ms McCorley for a supplement. Uh, would the Minister agree that there is a serious issue of public confidence here and that that needs to be restored by, by his party? And uh, would he also uh, accept that, given that uh, one of his ministers has had to resign, uh, that there are issues of human rights here and would the LGBT community not have a human right to be able to get married? Well, again, we come back to the issue of what is the definition of marriage, and I, I suspect that the Assembly has discussed this uh, for some considerable time uh, before questions uh, began. Uh, the definition of marriage that uh, many of us recognise uh, is that uh, it is a, a, an ordinance handed down by God uh, for the uh, procreation of children to ensure that a man and a woman uh, can get married. If there is a same-sex relationship, uh, that is, uh, if you can use the term, catered for, uh, within the, the scope of the existing law by way of a civil partnership. Uh, I cannot understand why we have to redefine uh, the uh, God-given term of uh, marriage uh, in order to uh, ensure that it covers something which already exists under the law by way of a civil partnership. Thank you. And I call Ms Brenda Hale. Mr Speaker, um, could the First Minister please update the House on the implementation of the Stormont House Agreement? Well, on a weekly base, uh, basis, the leaders of the parties have been meeting together uh, with uh, officials, including the, the head of the civil service, uh, to take forward the issues that uh, were uh, agreed by some, if not all, uh, at uh, Stormont House and Stormont Castle. Uh, the uh, progress has been made on a number of those uh, matters. Indeed, the executive at a, a recent meeting. Uh, dealt with uh, some of the uh, issues relating to the number of government uh, departments, which was part of the Stormont House uh, Agreement. Uh, other parts, decisions have been taken, but it is agreed will not be actioned until the, the issue of uh, welfare uh, has been dealt with. Uh, I think that it is probably fruitless for us to attempt to resolve that issue before or in the foot of uh, a general uh, election. But I will hope uh, that there will be concentration immediately. The election is out of the way to get that matter resolved because it is stopping the, the flow within the overall issues of Stormont House. I call Ms. Hale for supplementary. I thank the First Minister for his answer, and he has already talked about the election. Do you, First Minister, believe the outcome of the general election will have any implications for the resolution of welfare reform? Well, if I knew the outcome of uh, the election, uh, there will be issues, I suspect, uh, not substantial in terms of uh, the, the Labour Party. Uh, that uh, might change some of the aspects of it. The, the Labour Party is on record as indicating that they would do away with the bedroom tax. Uh, I think uh, everybody in this House knows, although some of them try to say otherwise, uh, that uh, the Deputy First Minister and I had agreed that the bedroom tax would not apply uh, in Northern Ireland, so it is part of uh, our proposals already to do away with the bedroom tax. Uh, therefore, if uh, in uh, the rest of the United Kingdom uh, they came up to, to scratch as we have on that issue, it would mean that we would get the Barnet consequentials, which would probably give us an extra 20 or 23 million pounds a, a, a year, which could be used uh, otherwise. In terms of the Conservative Party, I don't think anybody is quite clear 
what their full intentions are, at least the detail of their intentions in relation to uh, further welfare uh, changes. Uh, they are reluctant, I think, to give details, at least before the uh, 7th of May, on what those uh, may be. Uh, but it could well be that they will have further implications uh, for Northern Ireland. But in terms of the present set of proposals, the only change that I can see is if the new House of Commons was to vote against uh, having a, a bedroom tax. Uh, that would save us some money which could be applied elsewhere. Thank you. And I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the First Minister, does he believe that the outcome of the Westminster election will have any implications for the Executive's programme for government? Well, the, uh, the Executive is first of all going to update its uh, programme for government because since the original programme for government was published, a decision was taken to extend the term of the Assembly from four to five years. Uh, my understanding is that uh, that is moving uh, forward and uh, uh, members will be able to make their comments on that uh, in, in a matter, I hope, of, of weeks. Uh, in relation to the future programme for government, uh, obviously we have to have some knowledge of the comprehensive spending review that a new uh, government would be bringing forward to know what funds were available for us uh, to be able to action our programme for government. Uh, some of the elements uh, of our programme for government might be uh, improved if uh, there was a statistical advantage uh, gained by the presence of Northern Ireland members of uh, Parliament. Uh, I hope that they would use that not in any selfish party interest but in the interest of Northern Ireland as a whole. Uh, in those circumstances, there could be real benefits in a new Parliament. Well, I thank the First Minister for his fairly comprehensive and detailed response. But turning to the next uh, programme for government, uh, does the First Minister believe that there is the potential then to create more wealth and prosperity for the people of Northern Ireland? Well, any time I get a question like that, I usually first respond by pointing out just what we have succeeded in doing. And because uh, we have a very negative media in Northern Ireland, happy to tell us all the things that uh, we're not doing or doing wrong, uh, but slow to, to tell us that uh, in all of the United Kingdom there's more foreign direct investment per head of population coming to Northern Ireland than anywhere else, including yeah. London and the prosperous South East. Uh, they don't tell you that uh, Northern Ireland has had uh, more investment than at any time in its history, uh, even against the back cloth uh, of uh, a global recession. Uh, nor do they tell you that we have the lowest taxes in the whole of the United Kingdom, nor do they tell you that we have had more infrastructure built in Northern Ireland than at other times uh, in, in our history. So we have done a, a great deal, uh, so much in, in fact that uh, the Invest Northern Ireland uh, organisation has exceeded its targets, uh, even though we set targets which were very demanding uh, of them. Uh, in that context, uh, I believe that what uh, the executive needs to do is to continue uh, the path that they have uh, been on, which is getting growth into our, our economy, particularly growth which is export-led. Uh, all of that, uh, I, I believe, is important, and that requires us as an executive to be investing in the drivers of, of uh, growth, uh, issues such as uh, innovation, skills and training, even infrastructure in certain uh, areas as well, and trying to drive up productivity. Uh, that's what uh, provides uh, real stimulus to the uh, economy. It means that there are more jobs. From a Treasury point of view, it means that there is more uh, income tax. It means that there is more money being spent in the, the shops. Uh, people's earnings go up. Uh, that is the way to, to prosperity, by increasing growth. Thank you. And I call Mr William Humphrey. And Mr Humphrey, I may not have time for a supplementary if you want to, if you want to swap. <laughs> I um, thank the First Minister for his answers so far. Can I ask the First Minister if the, he believes the Northern Ireland economy has turned the corner? And if so, can that recovery be sustained? Well, I, I think that it is clear after 27 consecutive months of uh, the claimant count uh, reducing that uh, we perhaps are more than turning the, the corner. Uh, we have an unemployment uh, level uh, based on the Labour survey of 6 per cent. Uh, it indicates that more jobs are being created in Northern Ireland. Uh, again, I go back to the, the fact that uh, 
the 25,000 jobs which uh, Invest Northern Ireland had uh, committed to create. Uh, were, uh, we ended up, I think, with 37,000, over 37,000 jobs being created, a massive increase uh, on the, the number that uh, was set in our, our programme uh, for government. Uh, and that is uh, equally true when we look at uh, the uh, investment uh, over that period, which uh, was targeted to be £1 billion over the, the period and turned out to be £2.5 billion. So we are exceeding targets. We are on the road to recovery, uh, and I believe that it can be sustained. And that ends the period for, uh, listed, or for topical questions. If the House would take its ease for a moment while we change the